We're continuing the, with our study on the Revelation. We're into chapter 2. This is study number 8. And we've introduced these two chapters. We've looked closely at the first two of Jesus' letters to these seven churches. And we've considered uh, Ephesus and Smyrna. Some of our previous discussions apply to the remaining five letters. So we won't repeat those considerations. If you've missed previous message, messages, please go back and... Uh, View them, if you would. Let's consider the letter of Jesus to church number three, found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. That is the church at Pergamos. <clears throat> Let me read from the English Standard Version. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, or martyr, as the Greek word is, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So that they might eat food, sacrificed to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, if not I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers or overcomes. I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now notice Pergamus is located uh, spiritually where Satan's throne is, according to verse 13. Now Pergamus had a lot of Roman and pagan influences. The city was the first city to build a temple to Caesar Augustus. And the emperor worship at this time period was voluntary. So it's uh, interesting that Pergamus would be the first one to erect a temple to the emperor. Uh, it indicates just the greatness of the pagan influences. Pergamus prided themselves also in a temple to Zeus, uh, in a temple to Asclepius, the serpent god and image of two serpents adorned the temple of Asclepius. Some people think that the American Medical Association symbol represents the staff of bronze that God commanded Moses to create in the Old Testament in Numbers 21.9, so that those who were uh, bitten by the serpents who looked upon this uh, bronze serpent would be healed, and some think that that is uh, what the AMA symbol is. Well, in reality, uh, the AMA symbol is actually the double serpent of uh, sim the symbol of Asclepius, this pagan deity. The original Hippocratic oath taken by all physicians uh, was originally given in the name of Asclepius, not in the name of Christ. Any of these pagan practices, the temple to Zeus, the temple to Asclepius, the worship, emperor worship, could qualify Pergamos as Satan's throne in a symbolic sense. Look what 1 Corinthians 10, 20 to 21 tells us about those who worship false gods. Paul speaking here says, no, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So, you know, certainly uh, Pergamum having such uh, a uh, passion for false gods would certainly qualify them as a place where Satan's throne is. Because as Paul notes here, the worship of and the offering of sacrifices to false gods, to statues, to pagan deities, uh, was actually offering sacrifice to demons. Notice that Jesus describes Antipas as my faithful witness in verse 13. 
Now, Pergamos is one of the first churches to record the death of a believer, the death uh, we've called the martyrs. The Greek word simply means witness, but it's come to mean one who dies for the faith in our language. In the Greek, uh, the word meant witness. Not much is known about Antipas. We're simply told that he was killed among you where Satan dwells, but it's apparent he was killed for the faith. Uh, for the testimony of Jesus Christ, because Jesus calls him my faithful witness. So the church at Pergamos did suffer persecution for the faith, yet even this obvious persecution, uh, even in that, uh, the church is commended by Christ for not drawing back. In Revelation 1.5, I want you to notice that Jesus describes himself as the faithful witness. So now Antipas is also described and is described in this tender way as my faithful witness, Jesus speaking. What an honor to apply to Antipas the same title that Jesus applies to himself. Certainly persecution of a Christian is persecution of Christ. We saw that in the book of Acts when Paul is knocked off his high horse or donkey uh, and uh, Jesus exclaims to him, uh, you know, asks him, why are you persecuting me? And when the answer Jesus gives, would, you know, you're persecuting me when you persecute my church. Notice Jesus' criticism of this church at Pergamos in chapter 2, verse 14 of Revelation. The first charge in verse 14 is that some of the church teach Balaam's doctrine. Now, you may recall this prophet Balaam from the Old Testament. It's an interesting, he's an interesting character because he's a prophet that's not an Israelite. We find Balaam in Numbers chapters 22 to 24 and 31. Israel was still on the wilderness side of the Jordan River. Moses was still in command. Numbers 21, we read of Israel's conquest of the Amorites and their king Sihon. Next, Israel defeats Og, the king of Bashan. Israel was camped along the border of Moab and Balak, the king of Moab, knowing about the defeat of the neighboring country of the Amorites, feared the great company of Israelites that were right on his doorstep. And no matter how Balaam tried, the, you know, so he offered Balaam the prophet, a large sum of money to curse Israel. Uh, Balaam must have had a track record of sorts. But no matter how Balaam tried, he, God refused to allow Balaam to curse Israel. Balaam, however, had another plan. He wanted to make some money off this venture. So Balaam instructed King Balak to cause Israel to sin because uh, Balaam knew that if Israel sinned, God would judge Israel himself. So Balak sent prostitutes, probably temple prostitutes, into the camps of Israel, and the children of Israel committed fornication, adultery with these pagan prostitutes. And as a result, God sent a plague among the people. The plague only ended when Phinehas, a priest, killed an Israelite and one of the prostitutes, we are told in the very act, Numbers 25-7. But here in Pergamum, there are Balaam-like teachers, it seems, and they were encouraging Christians, it must be, to eat sacri uh, meat sacrificed to pagan idols and specifically involved themselves in sexual immorality. Pagan temples often used, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, prostitutes as a means of raising money. But being Balaam offered this advice to remove God's blessing from the people, uh, maybe pagans had infiltrated the church in an attempt to pull Christians back into their former pagan practices. We don't know. Jesus calls the Pergamum church to repentance in verse 16 of chapter 2. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with a sword of my mouth. Now, uh, Jesus is, describes himself in Revelation 1.16 as is described as him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Jesus is described in that first chapter as uh, in this uh, stylized vision of Christ as having a two-edged sword protruding from his mouth. 
And so here in Pergamos, this letter to the Pergamos church, uh, Jesus describes himself with that two-edged sword. And that's a warning that judgment is coming and they need to repent. Jesus is always calling the sinner to repentance. Judgment is the last thing he wants to do, but it is coming if repentance doesn't happen. Verse 17 of Revelation chapter 2, the one who overcomes or conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna. Verse 17, the one who conquers or overcomes is the one who's faithful, resists these temptations or repents of these sins. And in fact, Jesus is saying, if you stay away from the idol feast, I'll give you some hidden manna. There was a, a Jewish uh, story that uh, towards the end, uh, uh, the ark would be rediscovered and there would be um, the hidden manna that was placed in the ark would, would be uh, available again. We don't know that that's the intention of this uh, of this statement here, but there is a contrast, isn't there? Stay away from the idol feasts, and I will give you some of the hidden manna. And what does manna really represent? John six thirty one to thirty five. Jesus responds to these Jewish ones who are doubtful of who he is. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Then Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is the hidden manna that the Jewish people did not recognize. He is that uh, piece of matzah that is hidden in the Passover feast, and the children have to find. It's an interesting allegory, isn't it? Because it takes childlike faith to find Christ. He's the hidden bread, the hidden manna. Jesus says to that one who overcomes, I'll give him some hidden manna. Jesus always is the best reward. Jesus himself is always the best reward. Then the Lord says to the one who overcomes or conquers, I will give him a white stone, verse 17. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, there are three options for the meaning of this white stone, and I'm not sure which one best fits, but they're all a wonderful possibility. First, this white stone may be a reference to the a Roman court custom. And when a person was tried, he was given either a white stone if he was found innocent or a black stone if he was condemned. And that's a wonderful illustration, isn't it? I'll give him a white stone and we'll find him innocent. A white stone was also uh, a token to given to Olympic runners who won the race, and uh, it was used to redeem their reward at the end of the race. Well, that's a wonderful possibility as well. Uh, we're all in this race. Paul said, we're in a race, and we're in it to win. And Paul says at the end of his life, I've run the race. I've finished the course. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness in heaven. Yeah, they certainly could be that white stone that we're given this side of eternity in figurative sense. The most common explanation, thirdly, is that a white stone was often given to important visitors to a town as a sort of a key to the city with this stone. They, they had access to everything rather than a pass to idolatrous feasts. The overcomers promised a pass to Jesus' feast. Certainly fits the context. Could be any of those. It's All of them are wonderful. I don't think it's important that we, vital that we know. They're wonderful possibilities. 
The church at Thyatira, let's take a look at that church for a moment. Revelation 2, 18 through 29. And to the angel of the church at Thyatira write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, and your faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that you, your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, Thyatira was really the least significant city in Asia, and yet this city receives the longest letter from the Lord. The length of the letter seems to be because the church um, had great many problems. Thyatira was the hometown of Lydia. We met Lydia in the book of Acts. She was in Philippi. She was won to the Lord by Paul in Philippi, probably there. Uh, trying to sell her purple cloth, which uh, Thyatira was famous for. In Acts 16, 14, we read, One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Now, in Thyatira, pagan trade guild meetings offered incense to the pantheon of false gods. And if Christians wanted employment in these trades, they were tempted to compromise. There were lots of trade guilds in the town. Trade guilds were associations of tradesmen, sort of unions, early unions that kept their skills secret among themselves in order to protect their employment. And no one was trained or worked as a brick mason, dyeing fabric, other occupations, unless they joined the trade guilds. Now, these trade guilds used secret handshakes, passwords to keep secrets among themselves. Today, the Freemasons... Uh, which originally began as a trade guild of those who did brick masonry and operated in similar fashion using secret handshakes, passwords to keep their trade secrets. Uh, they were craft masons at that time, but a few centuries later, the Freemasons became a philosophical or religious organization using secret handshakes and passwords and the promise to teach hidden secrets, religious secrets to those who became members. In Thyatira, this Jezebel likewise promised to teach her followers the deep things of Satan, secret knowledge. Christians today should be concerned and careful about involvement. They shouldn't be involved in secret societies because a careful study of their teachings indicate these, their teachings are far from being Christian. They're far from being compatible with the teachings of Christ. We have many secret societies, not just the Freemasons, but the Moose, the Eagles, the Elk, many societies. The American Legion is a secret society, though it does patriotic things uh, behind its closed doors. It's a secret society performing rituals as well as the Grange. And Jesus identifies himself uh, here to this Thyatiran church <clears throat> as having eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze, according to Revelation 2.18. Now, this description of the Lord comes from the vision again that John sees of Christ in Revelation chapter 1, in particular, verse 14 and 15. Uh, Jesus is depicted as having eyes like a flame of fire, which indicates the fact that he sees all, even those things that are done in secret. 
uh, even amongst these trade guilds, and blazing eyes seem to indicate his anger. According to commentator Walter Barnes, flaming eyes indicate Christ's ability to penetrate into the very thoughts of people. Nothing is hidden to our Lord. Nothing is done in secret. The teachings and the practices of Jezebel, so-called, are identified by the Lord in verse 24, again, as the very deep things of Satan. The secrecy of the trade gills, this Jezebel's promise to teach her followers uh, deep things of Satan seems to be connected with uh, the Gnostic religious cults of the first century. Gnosis in Greek means knowledge. The Gnostic religions inducted people into their cults by claiming they will give them secret knowledge only known to them. The inductees must admit being ignorant and submit to learn these secrets from the master of the cult without knowing in advance anything about them. Modern secret societies, such as the Legion, again, the Grange, the Moose, the Masons, and so on, continue this practice of inducting new members into the society uh, in a ritual where they're blindfolded and must likewise admit their ignorance and submission or learn this hidden secrets only known by the order. And Jesus doesn't hide his secrets from his followers. Uh, Jesus has brought us from darkness into light uh, it is completely error to follow hidden secrets of men. Jesus is also described in verse 18 as having feet of burnished bronze. And in the Old Testament, being under the feet of another speaks of defeat, conquest, being humbled. Second Samuel 22, 39, First Kings 5, 3, Psalms 18, 38. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God if we refuse to repent. The commendations given here by the Lord to Thyatira seem awful short in verse 19. I know your works, your love and faith and service, patient endurance that your latter works exceed the first. That's, a, that's all he has to say. It's pretty general. It's pretty uh, generic. And these are wonderful commendations, but the Lord seems to hurry through them. Get right to the problems of the church. The good seems to greatly overshadow, be greatly overshadowed by the bad. There's a little bit more about the Jezebel problem from verse 20 to 24. This Jezebel-like woman is being tolerated by the church at Thyatira. It's unlikely this woman's name was Jezebel. That's a spiritual name. She is like Jezebel, the Jezebel uh, that was the wife of King Ahab. Uh, whose story is recorded for us in 1 Kings chapters 18, 19, and in 2 Kings chapter 9. Jezebel in the Old Testament murdered the prophets of God, set up false prophets throughout the land of Israel, defiled the temple. Jezebel was a wicked character. She seemed to rule the roost between her and Ahab and rule the country from behind the scenes. Though Ahab was king, he didn't practice his rule very well. It seems that Ahab, that Jezebel manipulated things. Characteristics of this Jezebel, verse 20, she calls herself a prophetess, and certainly the Lord is identifying her as a false prophetess. She, through seduction and her teaching, and her teaching is enticing believers to practice sexual immorality and idolatry. Given the plague of pornography in America and the internet, I wonder what is the Christ saying? Is Christ saying the same thing to us today? And as we've discussed already, this Jezebel claims to teach the deep things of Satan. Now notice the mercy of the Lord, verse 21. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Now, you know, there's a wonderful thing here. As, as wicked as Jezebel is, this Jezebel-like woman, the Lord gave her time to repent. I'm glad of that, aren't you? I'm glad he gave me time to repent. God does not want to judge. He wants repentance. He wants salvation. He wants to save people. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. I'm glad that Christ wants me to repent. 
Christ promised judgment on the followers of Jezebel who refused to repent. Look at what he charges and that he promises will happen. Jezebel will be thrown in a sickbed, verse 22. Her followers will be thrown into great tribulation, not the great tribulation. I don't believe that there is the great tribulation. Her children will suffer death. Those are her followers. And they will be judged according to their works. And in this case, the works of these followers of Jezebel will condemn them, verse 23. Even believers will be judged according to their works. Let's uh, be careful here because, you know, uh, uh, we, we fail to understand that even we will be judged according to our works. We're not saved by works, but we can be judged by them because our works prove our salvation. You will know them by their fruits. And so our works can be used to judge the reality of our faith. And so Jesus, so the, the Gospels, the, the, well, the, the Bible tells us that we'll be judged by our works. Romans 2, uh, 6 through 8. He will render to each one according to their works. To those who by patience and well-doing for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are seeking, who are self-seeking, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. There will be wrath and fury. Now we we hear the same thing in other places in the New Testament that will be judged according to our works. First Peter one seventeen, Galatians five six, James two fourteen, Revelation twenty two twelve tells us, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and bo the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. For those that have not followed this Jezebel, Jesus commands them, hold fast what you have, verse 24 and 25. Christ has no other burden to place on those that have been faithful. Just persevere. Perseverance is a central message of Christ throughout the revelation. Persevere, don't give up. And we need to hear that message as well. Jesus gives promises to the overcomers. He says in verse 26, I will give you authority over the nations and rulership. Verse 27, I believe this is a promise for the overcoming church of every age. And Jesus wants his kingdom on earth uh, to uh, his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. We say in the Lord's prayer in the here and now, not just in the sweet by and by. In verse 26 and 27, it's really taken from Psalms 2, 8, 9. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And then I will give him that overcomes the morning star, Revelation 2, 28. Now, what's that morning star all about? We're told in Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And Jesus will give himself to them. Is there any better reward than that? There never is. Jesus is the best reward of all. The Christian life is about getting Jesus. Do you know Jesus today? I hope so. This is Pastor Pete. God bless.